All right. Thanks again for joining us here on the Gale Athletics Track and Field Connections podcast. I'm super excited uh, really to help you understand what today's guest does and this new facility that he has that he's in charge of here. So let's get right into it. Help me welcome the, uh, this is a mouthful. He's the track and field coordinator, the director of track and field operations for the track and field center at Gately Park. It's the brand new, we're going to talk it my style now. It's the brand new indoor track facility up in Chicago, Illinois. Help me welcome Mr. Craig Collins. Craig, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. And thanks for having me, Mike. Oh, it's my honor. Uh, you know, you're two, two and a half hours away from us here in Champaign at the Gill Athletics factory. So uh, it's, uh, it's honestly a little weird maybe to do the interview over Zoom because we should just be together right now and just yeah. be talking. <laughs> Well, Craig, we're so uh, just blessed that you would join us today and give us your time and uh, help us learn not only more about you, which we'll do here in a little bit, uh, but also to learn about this really cool, unique, new track facility going on here in Chicago. Um, you know, little known secret, my coaching career started in Chicago. My very first coaching job was at De La Salle High School okay. up in the Chicago Catholic League. And mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you what, we did not have this type of facility when I was coaching there. So uh, why don't we start by telling us a little bit about the facility and, uh, and what you do there for the facility? Well, as you said, Mike, I'm uh, the track and field coordinator um, and the director of track and field operations. And so uh, there's a lot of track involved, obviously. And on the coordination side, uh, this is a Chicago Park District facility. And uh, it is a great, opportunity for track and field enthusiasts to be a part of something that is brand new in Chicago. This is something, the facility itself is something that uh, co track and field enthusiasts from coaches to um, just track and field, you know, the entire track and field community had dreamt of for over 40 years. And so, you know, we put together programs uh, because of its uh, recreational background being a track uh, a park district facility, programs that introduce and engage youth, but everybody, not just kids, uh, in a track and field experience. And so we have classes such as intro to hurdles, uh, intro to jumps, uh, shot put and throwing techniques, um, track and field 101, uh, just you know, introductory level courses uh, or programs for people to get involved in. And so I coordinate those classes with instructors so that uh, everybody is having a true track and field experience. Now on the directing side of, of operations, we plan to host a lot of meets, um, a lot of high caliber uh, competitions, uh, amongst collegiants, high schools, um, USATF championships, you name it, we want it. And uh, this facility is built to host those kind of things. And so, you know, my job there is to make sure that uh, those events are running well and it is in the true nature of track and field at is, as it's supposed to be. So um, I take great pride in that. And the fact that this is uh, a, you know, within Chicago South Side, I'm a South Sider. And so all of this kind of speaks of a, a, a growing, um, you know, a, a growing feeling amongst something that we can build on and uh, get track and field as a sport more exposure. So there's a organization in the sports construction world called the ASBA, the American Sports Builders Association. And this facility was the indoor track and field facility of the year for 2020. Craig, help us out. We're listening. If we've seen, there's been some pictures online. I know I shared a whole bunch of pictures on my Twitter for my tour. I was like, uh, it felt like Disney World. I just couldn't, uh, photos here, snap, snap, video here. Uh, but give us, as we're listening, kind of give us a, um, help us walk, walk through in our head. Give us a virtual tour of the track. Is it, you know, tell us is it a 200 meter, 300 meter throwing areas, things like that. Give us kind of help us visualize this awesome sure. facility. Uh, you know, I do the best I can. And, and, <laughs> and so I spend a great deal of time. And so some things I may at this point take for granted now, but uh, it is a 200 meter uh, Mondo track. Yeah, um, our good friends at Mondo, yep. And, and, and um, 
it is uh, has a great fast surface and um, banked. Um, it, it's it one of those a, um, those hydro banked, right? So you can do it, it on is. the flat right and at, bring it up, right? And exactly, exactly. And and I think that is a great process for us as we are dealing with the recreational uh, aspect of this facility as well. Um, but it is a it's hydraulically banked. Uh, it's a matter of pushing a button and it raises uh, up to five feet uh, approximately on both sides of the track, which makes for um, some very fast times. And yeah. uh, the past season, we were able to witness that. Um, it The facility holds 3,500 approximately. Um, oh, maybe yeah. a little bit. More. And, um, you know, when I heard that this facility was going to be state of the art, you know, I had no idea that this is what uh, the park district had decided to to put together. This is an outstanding. Uh, we have six lanes on the oval. We have eight lanes down the middle of the uh, of, of the track, um, which, um, you know, the, I think some of the widest lanes uh, that you can imagine. And, um, you know, it, it's, I have not heard a complaint. And, you know, the, we, Chicago track and field enthusiasts can be somewhat critical about uh, their track. And so we haven't had any complaints, uh, nothing more than this is one of the you know most beautiful places that they've had. And like I said before, a dream come true for everyone in this area, the Chicagoland area definitely needed it. So you mentioned six lanes on the oval, eight in the middle, which I know is fast. We've seen some results from this past year. Uh, it must be doing well. Uh, we have a local kid here, you know, right outside of Champaign is Muhammad. It's actually where I live. Uh, we had a Muhammad kid come down and jump like seven one in the high right. jump early in the like, like maybe December or January. I can't remember when it was, but it was early in the indoor season. That's right surface must be doing good you got a really awesome dedicated throws area just yes. on the outside uh sand pit forms of course for the long jump and triple jump uh and you know i might be a little biased but i think i believe might have the best track equipment in the country as well brand new pole vault pits hurdles starting blocks etc there uh, first class i'll tell you what here's something bravo to the city of chicago and the chicago park district did not skimp out here they wanted yes, a right. top of the level top of the line facility they, they did it uh they did a great job with the track and the surface and the hydraulic uh choice as well as how they staged 3500 seats what, what was that thing uh what were we remember when we were up in the um timers box great uh pretty cool like press box timers box as well uh yeah, but yeah. remember we, i was looking at something in the that's in the raptors and i couldn't remember what it was was that camera stuff for cameras for tv type stuff as well yeah, we have placeholders uh, throughout the facility. Wow. Um, and I would say close to 30 um, placeholders for various angles. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we definitely um, expect to have high caliber meets in which will be televised. Awesome. And so we, you know, are not missing a beat in terms of what some expectations are in terms of uh, camera angles and shots. Uh, there's focus on our throwing area, which you mentioned, uh, which I have to say, um, I've been around track and field for a very long time. And uh, on the indoor side, I have not seen many uh, spaces for throwing that rival this. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, a dream come true for the throwers uh, who in this city, have a hard time trying to find a place to yes. uh, work out, train, uh, not to mention compete. And so this facility has that. It touches on all those things that uh, you have dreamt about. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, 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 this is, like I said, a, a wonder. And you know, we've seen the enthusiasm come out uh, through some of the patrons uh, or participants in our open track and field programs uh, where they are uh, spending minimal amount of money to come in and train in this world-class facility. And when we're talking about training, we're talking about from hurdles to the jumps to the throws. Um, 
and that they can you can lie you utilize all of this and it's it's been great to see and the um you know I, I can't wait till next year when we're able to get beyond uh, the COVID and really see what potential this place has because it has nothing but potential as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, talk us through what was 2021 like. First of all, it's the first year opening the facility, which is always a tough because you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, how do you right. stage athletes and things like that? But on top of that, of course, we had this, the big C, right? The COVID yeah. going on. So what kind of meets were you able to put on? Uh, was there anyone that just didn't happen you thought was going to happen? I, I know we had... Um, Oh gosh, this is embarrassing. Uh, Paul Doyle, he was on the the uh, podcast a while back, and he had mentioned trying to get an American Track League up there, mm -hmm. and because of COVID, didn't happen. But talk to us about what kind of season we had, and maybe some highlights. Well, we were able to put together uh, eight meets, um, and those meets, uh, for the most part, took the form of high school showcases. Mm -hmm. uh, our first meet. Uh, took place the first weekend in February in more like a Kennison hosted a elite high school showcase. Now, now tell us, remind us for those who don't know that name you just said, because she's, she's a big time her and she helped yeah. with this meet. So I love her to death. Uh, yes, talk, talk to us about her, who she is and what her connection for this facility was. Well, more like a Kennison is a Chicago land native coming out of Aurora, um, Illinois state champion, um, graduate of Texas University, but started her collegiate career at Illinois. Yep. <laughs> and um, she is a world-class athlete now. Um, having seen her this past weekend uh, participate in the Mount Sac relay meet, oh, yeah. it was good to see her still engaged. And, you know, she's still quite young, uh, but she's a gold medalist. Um, so she comes uh, with some cachet. <laughs> and so she comes to Gately and says, I would love to host something for kids here. Um, we did all we could to make that happen. And it was, our, like I said, our first meet and it went well. Now we had some restraints in terms of numbers and uh, participants, but we had over 250 athletes compete and wow. we put together some of the fastest times to that point uh, in the country. I think um, young man from Southern Illinois area, uh, Battle, came to that meet and put down, I think one of the fastest times in the nation that day. Uh, Brandon Battle. I, Brandon Battle. I interacted with him on Twitty, Twitter the other day because he ran some smoking half mile time. This kid's going to be uh, a star. Oh, he's going to be great. Yeah. He's going to be great. Um, and uh, he is, you know, I'm glad to hear he is planning on doing his collegiate work within the state of Illinois so we can continue to see this kid progress. Yes. Um, and I'm lucky, and I'm quite pleased that uh, he, you know, we got a chance to see him up close and personal yeah. on, a, on a couple of occasions, and he did quite well. Awesome. Um, so, we had, you know, and I'm terrible with names. I'll get better. I, I should be, I should be better uh, <laughs> at, at some of the names, but we saw performances, you know, like number one ranked performances come in in the girls 800. Wow. Um, from the guys 600, um, the 200, 400 on both sides of the men and or girls and boys, as well as um, uh, the 60 meter dashes. And so, you know, we, there are a lot of facilities that say that this is one of the fastest in the country, but you know, I think we have the, the times to prove it. Um, and the fact that this was brand new, it, it, yeah. it, it uh, there, there were a great number of people who were just curious mm. and came from all around the country, from Boston to California to participate in the meets that we hosted. So I, I was going to ask that, you know, was it mostly Illinois and, you know, maybe Wisconsin, Indiana kids? Um, but you said you just pulled basically from East Coast to West Coast. What was the challenge like getting the word out that, hey, we're going to have these meets, here's the schedule, et cetera? Uh, in, in a normal year, that's hard. Uh, yes. But how did you do it in, in this? You know, we didn't even know we were going to have seasons here in Illinois for, for track and field. Well, I think uh, without a great deal of advertisement on our part, uh, we relied heavily on the track and field community at large mm. to get the word out. 
and that we were hosting events and those that uh, could travel to Chicago, you know, we welcomed them. And uh, there were, you know, restrictions, of course. Um, we put together a schedule that accommodated a certain number of athletes uh, plus a coach or parent at a time. And after one session was over with, we brought in a new session. And so we had that rotation going and we developed it quite well. Um, and I think we will see some of that throughout the course of beginning stages of next season as well. Maybe not only for our facility. I think things went so well that people were getting used to a schedule where they may not have to stay the entire time or wait for you know uh, um, their son or daughter to finish the 200. They, it was a situation in which they can come back later. Or And, and so we made it convenient, um, spectator friendly, although we were quite limited on the number of spectators we could have. Right. But what we wanted, and the overall goal was to give a great track and field experience for everyone that came into that door. We wanted people to say great things about this place so that uh, the word would get out for the future. And for us, the future is now. Well, wow. Did you just, do you have a t-shirt that says that? You just made like a t-shirt slogan right there, man. Holy cow. Track center at Gailey Park. The future is now. I love, wow. Hey, that would be, yeah, yeah, that would be. In fact, now uh, I think I will go and talk, call, make a few yeah, calls. Yeah, yeah. I got like goosebumps, man. Come on. <laughs> you you got to be in the marketing department here now. Come on. That's awesome. Uh, talk to us about, you know, there's there's really good facilities in a lot of places in this country um, for training and things like that. Chicago being one of the largest cities in this country, if not the world, um, never had a facility like this. I remember when we, when I coached out there, we used to have to go to Proviso West. I think it was all the time. Uh, De La Salle didn't even have an indoor facility. We used to train in the hallways, which here's news alert. If you don't know anything, know much about Chicago track and field on the high school level, I would venture to say, Craig, you know, it probably better than I do the vast majority. I mean, I will, I'll put 80% on it. Maybe it's higher kids train in the hallways. There, there just isn't practice areas. Uh, you know, it's, you're trying to practice during for indoor during basketball season. Hello, it's Chicago. You ain't getting that basketball court. Right. <laughs> so you got the right. hallways and then there's some facility, you know, De La Salle now has a 160 meter track, I think. So they've got some things going on, but there hasn't been this place for uh, education of coaches and for uh, uh, co competitive opportunities for Chicago high school athletes specifically until now. What, what is this facility? As you think about the future as now, as you kind of put your crystal ball here and look into the future, what does a facility like this do for the city of Chicago in relationship to track? Well, I think it changes the game. I think it changes um, the perception of track and field being um, more than a Olympic sport. It is definitely an Olympic sport, but there are so many avenues within track and field that can lead you to other areas of athletics. And I think people are recognizing that. Uh, if, if I could go back to the meet that took place at Mount Sac this past weekend, mm -hmm. where a lot of attention was put on, I think DK Metcalf. Oh, DK, yep. <laughs> and um, who is a phenomenal athlete and put together a great time. Heck of a time. Um, in, in the hundred. And, you know, people fail to realize that his 10-3 was quite fast, but it, you know, would not make, you know, some high school finals. Right. In this, at, at, at the state level. And so, you know, we, we're talking about great kids, great athletes who have put forth a great deal of time. And so I think um, the fact that this facility is here in Chicago, I think it will uh, wake up um, a different group of people mm -hmm. and pay more attention to, you know, the ind individualized aspect or element of track and field and balance that off with perhaps a team element. So you could play basketball and be a great basketball player but you also have, you know, those talents can also be served well in track and field in the jumps, high jump, triple jump, long jump. Um, and so I, th I think when I th we're able to expose that, 
And you know, the reason why I think it's important that we have these programs, these classes for youth aged kids mm -hmm. primarily. And so it exposes them to those things. Um, we're, you know, and we're dealing with coordination and balance and, and, and cardio and all those things can um, fan out to other sports, whether it be volleyball, basketball, football, baseball. And so we are making ourselves part of the huge game of athletics, I think. And so, whereas without this facility, it was a struggle because kids were running in the hallways and that can be a deterrent. Uh, for most school districts because of the liability aspect that could happen. You know, these floors weren't rubberized. These floors were as slick as ice in some cases. Um, and so now, you know, they have the ability to come here and train or participate at a high level because we plan to have um, CPS and Catholic League city championships here Good. where, you know, they would have to go out of Chicago in order to have that, 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 that championship. We plan to have high caliber events so that we can bring the best of the best from all over the country to compete with our kids. Um, and so I think it, I really do believe it changes the game. Um, and I think we will see in the coming years uh, more kid and more kid friendly involvement. I think we will see um, the park district growing as a result of that mm. um, because the park district, Chicago's park district has struggled in my opinion uh, with developing their own programs within track and field. And so this levels the playing field and puts us in some cases uh, above and beyond any expectations that we've had in, in concerning ourselves with the, the, the development of track and field. And so I, I'm looking forward to seeing this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm of the age where I ran in the hallways. And I remember there was an incident years ago in which, uh, you know, no, we had to have no hallway running. I went to uh, Percy L. Julian High School, uh, better known for football, but we had, you know, a pretty good track and field program there as well. And all of a sudden, the meets that we had looked forward to for indoor season had to be shut down because of an incident that took place in the hallway where uh, a young man injured himself oh. trying to make a sharp turn. Mm. And so this facility is not that. You know, this is leaps, years, light years from that where we were. And I think Chicago is headed in the right direction. We have um, put forth a great deal of resources and thought to um, the track and field experience for any and every kid. And I think that's what makes this facility special is that this is a track and field facility, but it also is accompanied with great recreational resources for basketball, volleyball, pickleball. Um, and, and so we were able to bring the community um, as a whole in and not just isolate, you know, this is track only kind of situation, which you find in some cases that you know, like you said, there are facilities being built up. And, you know, if you're not in a track, um, then there's no sense of going to that facility. But for here, there's a little something for everybody. Yeah, I love how you talked about the camps. And then, of course, what, uh, you know, so younger kids, and then what we're talking about with the high school meets, you know, you talked about CPS, which is the Chicago Public Schools, and then uh, kind of the rival cat league is the Catholic League, the Chicago Catholic League. Right. Uh, and then, of course, you know, there's a myriad of colleges, you know, we had a good friend, the Loyola head coach, uh, Bob Thernhofer was a guest on the show, uh, you know, yeah. so their conferences, and then you don't have to go very far where you start talking about, you know, there's Big Ten schools, heck, the Big Ten conference uh, headquarters is right there in Chicago. And then, of course, we move up into the professionals with the USATF and uh, those kind of athletes. So I just love the gamut. I feel like it's an immediate uh, upgrade and impact on the city of Chicago as it relates to track and field, but also the longevity, like in the next four to eight years, those kids, you know, there's going to be some eight year old right now that was at your hurdles camp that never thought they could do hurdles, but they learn how to do hurdles and, you know, by high school, they're going to be a state champion and then they're going to go on to race somewhere and be awesome, all because of 
an eight year old camp that you did there. You know, I just love that gamut of uh, impact that you're making there with the facility. Yeah, and and you're absolutely right. I, and 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 so you know, I am here in this space, but I can tell you, I was influenced by a great many a coach uh, in my long past of being involved with track and field. And so this uh, was the brainchild of a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Conrad Whirl, who uh, had invited me about 11, 12 years ago uh, while I was a, mm, I think I was a high school, just at, you know, a high school coach at the time, um, who invited me to come and sit in on a meeting that involved track and field. And the group was called and still is Friends of Track and Field. Hmm. And uh, one of the things, one of the objectives was to um, get the city to invest in an indoor track and field facility. Now at the time, and I think within the first couple of years, my vision had been merely a field house with a track in which you can compete in meets. Well, uh, you got uh, that on steroids. The idea <laughs> grew. <probably. laughs> oh yeah, absolutely <laughs> right. And and so uh, this and it became you know words or phrases such as state of the art and world class facilities started to uh, be involved in the conversation. And and this is the result of that. Uh, but I could tell you there were uh, several coaches uh, that I have run across in my years of coaching that um, dreamt of a place like this um, and not so much to train, but so that to compete hmm. and it bank the bank element of this, the, the, hydraulic bank wasn't necessarily the, the idea. Uh, it just enhances the performances, but it was, you know, this signifies a way for track and field to be taken seriously in the Chicagoland area, primarily in Chicago. And so um, the other objective of this Friends in Track and Field organization was to bring more attention to track and field within the city, primarily the Chicago public schools that had a drought of about four to five years where they no boys had made the finals at the state meet. From all and of so the Chicago public schools. Friday, one and done. And you'll go down on you'll go down on Friday and to the coaches or the school's discretion, you're leaving Friday night. Now, because there was no Saturday. That's remarkable when you think about how big the Chicago public school system is. We're not talking about some five school league here. And you're talking about some right. amazing athletes. I mean, you're talking about go look right. at the, the right. collegiate ranks in football. There are plenty of kids from Chicago public schools. Go look at the, the NCAA ranks of basketball rosters plenty from the Chicago public schools. And there was a drought of about five years where no boy was able to make the finals at the state meet. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and it, it was embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, as a public school coach, um, you, you know, you, you know, you value everybody's performances, whether they're a public school kid or not, uh, because you know, the hard work that went into developing these kids to run participate at this high level. Mm -hmm. But when you, you know, you are not identifying with anybody on Saturday because, you know, it's nice to see the city champion in these city meet, you know, is coming in last in the, right. in the rounds of the hundred or the 200, it makes you question what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, is it, do they have the jitters? But what it really came down to, we weren't prepared. And so uh, Friends of Track and Field made a point to get more involved with the Chicago Public Schools, but also the local track and field youth groups. Um, and so there were camps developed. Um, there were small versions of meets developed 
training developed for coaches as well as um, uh, athletes, young athletes. And uh, it took a group of coaches like myself, Derek Calhoun, um, to name a few. I mean, there was a, you know, a, a large body of us with, that had bought in to this idea, not knowing where it was going to go. And then we suddenly saw, you know, a few years, you know, hey, kid from Phillips wins the 100 and 200 uh, at state meet, which yeah. was like, wow. You know, Phillips hadn't won anything since, <laughs> I think the early eighties, the Sunder Knicks. And all of a sudden we had a kid out of nowhere winning the, the 100 and 200. And, and so that became motivation for us to really get this thing going. Uh, and so um, Chicago Public Schools had a series of, of camps throughout the summer that allowed coaches like myself, Derek Calhoun, uh, to put together camps, training centers over the summer, invited as many coaches that want to be involved. They can bring their athletes from their school and we work from there. Hmm. Now, Derek, was already set. He, his girls, you know, I think he's eight, seven to eight time state champion uh, at Morgan Park Mustangs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this really didn't affect him as much. I mean, it made his teams better, but, you know, he took it upon himself to, you know, everybody, you know, you can go to Harlan and be involved in the Morgan Park camp. And so, all of these camps had the same mode. If you, you know, any school, any kid uh, at the time can be involved and it's this training. So we exposed them um, greatly to a lot of track. And I think the easiest way to do that was to get them involved in the summer track circuit. So we ran a lot of USATF meets. And uh, there we began to see, you know, not just, you know, the sprinters coming up, come off for the boys, but we start seeing jumpers. You know, we start seeing the occasional basketball player in, you know, in the triple jump hmm. or the high jump and winning at the city level, qualifying the state and maybe making the finals. And, uh, you know, I, I recall, and I tell kids this a lot, I was at a city championship in which I didn't know who he was, but one of the fastest kids on the track was Derrick Rose. Huh. on the four by two relay is that right and ran and it's that's right Simeon high school ran a hell of a leg and i'm thinking this dude who is this <laughs> and you know little did i know that uh he was just doing this for uh conditioning or maybe uh. punishment but he ran he ran one of the best legs i've seen best 200s on, oh. a, on a relay leg that i've ever seen at the city level Huh. And so, um, you know, that, that kind of thing, I think, motivates kids, you know, and, and so it, and we oftentimes kind of pigeonhole a kid into one direction. And, and I do understand that. I mean, I, I, as a coach, I understand that you want a kid's focus, but I think track and field allows you to broaden your expectations of your abilities. Yeah. And again, this facility helps support that idea that you can come in and, you know, and I've had baseball kids uh, most recently, I just want to get faster and, or their mothers or fathers will come in. Can you help them? He needs to get faster. Um, basketball guys, um, you know, they need to work on their vertical. And so track and field allows us to really, you know, use this as a lab, as it were, to enhance and promote track and field from other areas. Now, we love, you know, uh, the idea of, you know, Shamir Little, for instance, had she had uh, this to train on, to use this as a platform at the city championship meets that she's competed in throughout the years while she was in high school at Lindblom, how much better could she have gotten? You know, how much more exposure, exposure how, how fast were her times really have been if she had the proper uh, uh, setup for her in terms of the facility. And we have no excuse now, we're here. And so my job uh, as coordinating 
a lot of the programs here is to make sure that kids get that experience that they need, that they desire so that they can go off and do those great things that they always dreamt of doing. And uh, the other thing is there's a lot of great role models out here uh, throughout the world of track and field and Chicago always fell short. Now, you know, we deal with a lot of crazy weather. And so indoor track and field just makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's hard to replicate what Usain Bolt might be doing um, or uh, uh, Shikari Richardson, for instance, who is the, who the new face in town because they work out in warm weather uh, climates 90% of the time, if not 100% of the time. Whereas if you're in Chicago, you, you know, it, it's, it's cold today. You know, um, I'm sure there's a few teams uh, or more than a few teams out practicing, getting ready for future meets uh, because the sun's out and it's, and it's just 49, 52 degrees. Uh, but for most people, that's, that's really, really cold, too cold to be outside. And so this provides an option for them to come in and work on several things, uh, not just the running, but the technical aspects of things. And so, uh, and I also think that this would be a great uh, way to kind of duplicate further uh, ideas about building facilities throughout the city. Um, oh, yeah. One of the biggest complaints that we've gotten is that, yeah, that's a brand new track, but they don't have hurdles, or that's a brand new track and they don't have long jump pits. And there's no place for me to throw at this brand new facility or a uh, facility that was built outdoors. Um, and so I still wanna be able to come to Gately and work on my hurdle technique, or can I use your throwing, um, throwing cage so I can you know, continue furthering you know, uh, um, my, my practice. And so that, this is a perfect situation for that. And we have kids and, and athletes coming from all over the country, well, all over the city, and uh, every now and then they'll come from all over the country to train. We've had um, at least 10 aspiring Olympians who are looking to get invites to their to the US Olympic trials, but Jamaican Olympic, the uh, uh, Jamaican trials. And there was one other that I was, um, it's a European country, but she's training to prepare for uh, some, championship in her country. And so that just puts us right in the in the heart of some good things here for track and field. And I'm, and, and I'm pleased to be part of it. Yeah, it's exciting. You know, the city of Chicago has the athletes that's never been in doubt. And for someone, I'm so blessed that I got to spend two years as a high school coach up in Chicago. There are amazing high school coaches in the Chicago and Chicago land area. You, you mentioned uh, coach Derek Calhoun a couple of times. Uh, I don't know if you know this yet, but uh, he's going to be on the show as well. We've got him scheduled. So in a couple of weeks, we'll get, yeah, we'll get to talk to Derek Calhoun, legendary coach at Morgan park high school uh, coached right. amazing a athletes, including one of my favorites, uh, Alexandra Anderson. It's going to be a great time That's talking right. with him, but uh, so there's always been, great coaches, always been great athletes. Uh, we have definitely lacked facilities in, in the great city of Chicago, mm -hmm. but what this does is it impacts and it brings everybody instead of having, you know, uh, 15 great coaches in Chicago, we're going to have 50 great high school co track coaches instead of having uh, on a right. yearly basis, 50 great athletes coming out of Chicago, we're going to have 500. I mean, it's uh, the impact right. is amazing. You mentioned some of the, um, uh, community uh, aspects of the track as well, as far as the facility as well. Uh, talk to us about, there's this uh, learning center, there's a, like an academic part to Gately Park track. Well, so that is still under development. Um, you know, we are uh, for the most part, a park district facility. And so with our uh, endeavors to make this a space for track and field, it is very much a recreation area. And so we haven't utilized uh, our space that we have for uh, the uh, additional instruction 
um, as it applies to uh, school work, et cetera. Uh, now, there are some facilities that are coming up that definitely uh, have that. And I, and I think they do that quite well. Um, you know, we are not there yet. Um, you know, and I think a lot of it is, you know, our focus uh, is to represent the park district as best we can and their recreational endeavors. But there is a component to this facility um, with After School Matters, uh, which, you know, share the building. Okay. And so their instruction, uh, their programs that they uh, institute uh, provide a, an enormous array of uh, activities and programs um, uh, to enrich the lives of young people. And from, you know, they have a, you know, we talk about the state of the art for track and field. Well, they have a state of the art kitchen, um, you know, beyond our doors of, of this facility. They have, you um, uh, dance studios. They have um, 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 classrooms slash uh, meeting spaces for student activities. Um, they have computer labs, and so you know. I, and again, you know, this was kind of brought out with you know various needs um, in, in one building, kind of coming together and saying, "Let's do it." And I think that's somewhat unique. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as, as much as we are taking um, credit for developing athletes, we have After School Matters, uh, you know, also doing some great things and enriching the lives of young folks um, awesome. throughout the city. And so After School Matters is a program um, that uh, work with kids, employ kids, uh, in various directions from business to athletics to uh, the culinary arts, uh, dance, the um, um, painting, you name it. And uh, so we're sharing that building. And in fact, one of the After School Matters programs is a uh, program in which they are training young people for uh, to become officials in track and field, which is a brilliant idea Dude. because I'm not sure that the average age of our coaches within the state of Illinois is 66 years old. Um, and there's a, there's somewhat of a shortage of, of officials. And so now we're tapping into bringing some youth into that profession. Bravo. And yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I think it's really clicking on all cylinders here. And that, again, I could not have, I could not be a part of this at a better time um, to witness and be a part of and have some say at, in the direction in which track and field takes in this city uh, from various areas. And, you know, the, the good thing is I have a lot of good friends that I can rely on to assist me that I can lean on and ask, you know, consult with about the direction that this place needs to go to better the lives of track and field people primarily, but kids in general. Now, what, what can we do to make this a better space? I, I love that. I mean, what a, a multiple resource facility that obviously we're going to be focused on the track portion, those six lanes on the outside and eight on the inside, uh, but to have a whole community effect and then this officials training, uh, yeah. I mean, that that is how you change the sport of track and field immensely. I mean, you know, that that's you put a huge thumbprint <laughs> on uh, the sport yeah. of doing that. That's yeah. awesome. So, Craig, before we yeah, I mean, it, I was gonna say before we pivot and learn, no, go ahead. Before we pivot and learn a little bit more about your journey as a track coach before you came to Gately, what has got you excited? What can you share with us? Maybe peel the curtain back a little bit on 2022 for Gately Park. Is there any big meet you can tell us about, or is there another uh, big invite from an athlete? What, what can you tell us about what's coming up here at Gately Park? Well, um, I know, and I, I, I'm not quite sure if we are, I can name the conferences, but mm -hmm. 
you know, we plan to entertain a great number of collegiate events. Awesome. Um, and, you know, the beautiful part about it is we, you know, we worked in small doses for 2021. And so I know we want to have three times, four times as many track and field events as we had in the past season. Um, so I don't, you know, there are some local universities and colleges in the area that have, you know, made huge steps to bring their conference here for, for their conference championship. And I think that this is a great place for that. Um, and, you know, I, one of the things we did, uh, we entertained a few collegiate meets last season. That was one of our, two of our eight meets were collegiate meets. And a um, good friend of mine, Dave Dopek at DePaul uh, put together, you know, we put together the um, Big East Triangular, which, you know, um, included Marquette University and Butler. And, you know, the Big East is a, is a pretty broad conference with a lot of teams on the East and you have Creighton in the Midwest, but they're in Nebraska. And so we just dealt with that close proximity. No team has to stay in a hotel overnight kind of situation. They come in and it was a great meet. It was, you know, it was ideal because of the numbers. Um, you know, the teams were relatively small. Uh, we ran a, you know, the entire complement of events that you would find at any collegiate uh, competition. And it went off very well. And so I think that will speak on uh, some good things in the future in terms of us accommodating some, some collegiate meets. Um, you, you, you spoke of Bob over at Loyola and uh, we've had the luxury to have him and his team come in and, and work out um, regularly. And, um, you know, I think that they, you know, I'm not sure how they feel about it, but, you know, we looked at them as, you know, this kind of is their second home. This is a place where they trained. And so we wanted them to feel comfortable in every corner of the building. And so I think, you know, if they feel that way and they think they can bring forth um, the NVC um, here to Chicago, I think that'd be a great thing, not just for, uh, you know, for Chicago and us here in, in at, at the Gately Center, but I think it would be great for uh, the conference um, because, you know, the NVC is a regional conference. And so I can imagine most schools being able to drive in and, and, and take advantage of the amenities that we have here. So, you know, I think we're moving in the right direction there. And, you know, we, we've also uh, gotten in touch with not only Chicago high school conferences, uh, but we've gotten, you know, those in the Chicagoland area, um, as far out as Manuka, um, and the conference that they're in. And again, I'm, I'm, I can't remember what conference that would be, but, um, and, and so we're there for them and, and we want to make this a great experience for them. And so it's not often that, you know, kids can say that they've run on a world-class facility or the same facility in which, uh, potential um, world record holders right. or, or elite athletes have participated on. Um, so it, you know, it's, it's the environment that we want to maintain uh, at a high level to provide all the services that one can think of in using this facility such as this. Well, we can't wait for you to put out your 2022 schedule because uh, it's going to be just littered with amazing track meets and therefore amazing athletes. You did eight meets this year. It, that's going to look paltry compared to what you start putting together, how many meets you put together in 2022. You're going to wish a couple of late nights. You're going to wish you only had eight meets to. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what I'm afraid of. But I can tell you, you know, we, we started, you know, we started last October preparing for what we'd hoped would be our opening in, in November. 
And, um, you know, COVID just didn't allow any of that. And so we were pushed back from November to December. And uh, we thought we might be able to get in somehow in January. And it just wasn't to be. And it seemed as though every time we got close to putting together a meet uh, in which, you know, weeks or days later, we're going to actually get it done, there'd be a spike, you know, within the state or the nation and the awareness of, you know, just being careful resonated at a high level. And, we, and it was just in our best interest to shut things down. But we're hoping that uh, in starting late this year, we are able to kind of set a great tone for what's to come in 2022. Yeah, that's going to be so exciting. I can't wait to be there. Uh, I have zero excuses to not come up to at least the big invites because I'm two and a half hours away. So I, I hope I always have an invitation, Craig. That, yeah, okay. Uh, I you always to, have invitation. Yeah, you know that. I, I wanted to get that recorded so that everybody, like I got that. It's official now. I, I have an invite uh, if I ever want to get up there. And we will. I, that'll be a lot of fun. So always welcome. That's amazing. And I'm super, super excited. This. Let's take a step back and let's learn more about you. You mentioned uh, being a Chicago guy. Uh, you went to high school at, at Julian, I think you said. Uh, talk to yeah, us about that's right. what, how did track become a part of your life? Where'd you go to school? Did you run in college? Uh, and how did coaching ever become a profession for you? Well, um, you know, I, I guess nine years old. Well, so, you know, I, I, I got, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was the journey for sure. Um, I had gone through uh, several of the, you know, the, the regular sports that a kid would go through baseball and then basketball. And, um, you know, I was uh, most often the fastest kid on the playground. Um, but, you know, I, one unique thing, you know, I lived right across Eckersall Stadium which is a, um, it's kind of a football track stadium uh, that often hosted uh, Chicago public school events, football games and track events. And um, one summer they were, uh, the city put together uh, what's called the Arco Jesse Owens games. And um, I remember you know, like hearing a lot of, you know, excitement. And it was like, I, I lived right across the street. And so I ventured over there, uh, unbeknownst to my mother, who, um, you know, was concerned after the fact where I was. And it turned out I was in the stadium. And not only to witness, I, I forgot how it happened, but I was thrust into signing up for a race. And uh, I was ill-prepared for any track and field whatsoever. And I, and I ran in my stocking feet. I remember that vividly. And, uh, but, you know, I qualified to like the finals of, I think it was the 50 meter. And, uh, uh, you know, at, at that time, my mother had showed up in the event ready to really lay into me about just leaving the house um, without her knowledge. And so uh, I remember uh, a friend of mine, you know, a dear friend now whose dad kind of talked my mother down off of whatever was about to come my way in terms of discipline. And uh, well, wait till he finishes his race before you get into him. And so I ended up getting second uh, uh, that year. And so, uh. That was the start of it. And uh, the following year, I, I won that same event, which thrust you to, you, you uh, won, to run you, in California. You won with mom's permission that second year. I won with mom. She okay. was all on board Good. after she saw that. Uh, Thank you, mom. This was something that I liked doing. And this was something that I was pretty good at. And so I had mom and dad kind of were on board ever since then. And so, uh, you know, it, it kind of took off from there. From there, it became, um, you know, I'm, I began running with a youth club in the same stadium, which mm -hmm. was right across the street from the home. 
uh, the Chicago Falcons, and then ultimately the uh, Chicago Zephyrs became my youth program under the tutelage of uh, Miss Jane Dickens. And uh, I think, you know, I, I give her credit that I may not be here uh, doing what I do if it were not for her. Um, Cause she kind of, you know, not only showed me the way uh, it, it, you know, within a life of track and field, but kind of, you know, these are the, you know, this is the kind of person you want to be. And this is how you interact. Awesome. people. Uh, and so, um, you know, from going to high school and running track and playing football, uh, turned into uh, a invitation to come to Indiana. And I say invitation, I, I had to earn a scholarship mm -hmm. at Indiana University. Uh, but within a year, year and a half, I had earned, you know, some money to, you know, be a student athlete at Indiana. And, uh, wasn't quite as good as some of my peers. Um, um, one off the top of my head, Albert Robinson, who I idolized because he was from the same neighborhood. We walked the same straits and he was an all American. I remember wow. a senior in high school going to see him at Dyke Stadium in Notre Dame, at Northwestern wow. winning big 10 championships in the 100 and the 200 meters. And I was wow. like, man, this is, this is, Unbelievable, and so um, so I hadn't gone to Indiana and and running track there, and then getting another great education, uh, not only academically but you know to kind of see where my path would go. Uh, Coach Sam Bell was that oh, influence yeah. on me uh, to kind of said, you know, you don't have to be. Everybody's not going to be a star in track and field. You might, you know, if you love the sport, as I guess I you know, exemplified, you, you know, you, there's other ways to do it. You might become a great coach. And so um, I stuck to that, you know, I listened to him. And once I graduated, I, you know, my major was uh, in education and I became a teacher in Chicago public schools. And I jumped into not just being an English teacher, but also a coach. And so things just kind of morphed there. And, you know, what I found was, you know, I was, getting more respect from my students being coach Collins than I was than being Mr. Collins. Uh, so, you know, that's, <laughs> I, I stuck with that. You know, I, I got um, less behavior problems in the classroom as coach Collins than I was as Mr. Collins. And so um, that kind of led me into, you know, various roles within the school. Uh, and, and so the, coaching thing was really working for me. Then I got a call to uh, you know, assist at Robert Morris, a good friend of mine was the head coach there. This is Robert Morris in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a girls team. And, um, you know, she needed help with not just recruiting something that I was somewhat unfamiliar with, uh, but, you know, the sprinters. And so I coached the sprints, the jumps and the hurdles and was there for three years until I got another call to, to um, direct Chicago State. Um, and I had been there for nine seasons. And, uh, you know, I, I never had, you know, the great uh, privilege of working with programs that had seen a great deal of success. Um, all of my coaching positions had been developmental. You got to build the team. You got to find the kids. You got to make the kids track kids. So, and so none of those jobs came easy. And um, I think that prepared me well for where I am now yeah. uh, in terms of the development aspect of the sport. And so, you know, so there, there, you know, I don't look at any athlete. Um, as if, you know, they won't be a success or they're not good enough. Um, I find something uh, in every athlete that I work with. And so I've worked with kids who, you know, who have started out, you know, quite uncoordinated to, you know, becoming state, you know, finalists mm -hmm. at their high school meets or uh, working with kids that, 
you know, no school in the country would give them a look. And so I would take a chance on that kid and, and, and he would, you know, he ended up being part of our uh, national qualifying four by one relay team. Wow. So, you know, I, I just, you know, I think my experience has kind of led me there. I was never that, that all American athlete myself. And so I kind of use my experiences and, and mirror those to the kids that I work with and um, try to make the impossible possible. Yeah, as you were mentioning your career at IU uh, and then taking over or uh, helping out with Robert Morris and then Chicago State, it, as you were telling that story, I started thinking, it's like, well, that's the perfect person you want to start a facility. Uh, you know, there's different skill sets uh, yeah. amongst coaching yeah. and business. You know, there's some people that are really good and geared towards starting a business and getting it to a certain point, but they can't grow the business past the next hump. Uh, there's other people that are the exact opposite. They couldn't start a business to save their life, but they can come into a business and get it growing. Same with a program or a facility like this. There's people who have a skill set of starting from scratch. You, th nothing is written down. You have to write the playbook completely versus someone who comes in and says, oh, okay, I see how everything's already working. I can help make that better. Yeah, your skill set is the, the blank page. Uh, okay, Greg, Craig, here's the, uh, the book. It's not written help us write it. <laughs> that's a, that's a skill yeah. set. Yeah. Does, does that kind of stuff excite you? I mean, you've done it several times now, so I hope it does, but is, is, does that kind of like, it, it, yeah, I used that fingerprint analogy earlier. Does that kind of stuff, is that what kind of gets you going? What's your motivation? Well, it, it does. Now I, I tell you, it's not something that I, I, I seek out though. Uh, it is something that just kind of falls into my lap and I try to make, you know, whatever situation it is, better and so um yeah but i am motivated to do those things I, I want you know i want excellence i want people to say you know i've never realized that could be as good as it is and so um you know those are you know some of the things that uh you know we work on and 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 you know they're not easy and i don't you know i know everything that i have endured has been somewhat of a challenge but you know the end result i want it to be one that I'm satisfied with and can sleep at night, but the people that are around me know that they were part of something special. Uh, and, you know, this sport has uh, allowed me to be around and circulate amongst a lot of great people, uh, people that I don't think otherwise I would have ever met. And so I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I work hard so that, you know, the you know, so I can continue on that journey of, of meeting great people and being around uh, great events um, because I, I truly love the sport and I love, you know, you know, it's something about track people, yeah. you know, that uh, I don't think you'll get out of, you know, basketball people or baseball people or whatever. I think track people are within themselves unique. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate it. And so this is my way of, of showing my appreciation. And, you know, I believe hard work pays off. And so I put, you know, all that I have into what I do so that not just for me, but for people that are around me can see that, um, you know, when you give 110%, good things happen. And so, you know, thus far things have been working out uh, quite well in terms of, <laughs> you know, being, yeah, I mean, really, I mean, it, to come here to, to Gately, you know, it's a dream come true. Yeah. Uh, because I remember like, you know, you know, some of these hallway school mm. events in high school. Well, there were some schools that were being built in the, in the eighties that could not accommodate that kind of, I mean, they were, the hallways were too small. Mm -hmm. uh, they were built, you know, the architecture was, was, was totally different. And so, you know, it was either in, no track and it, it always seemed like they were pushing you into a different sport, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and so, you know, I love track. I mean, I loved other sports too. I played football and I played basketball and I played a little baseball, but track was something that for me, it was immediate gratification. You know, I got, I knew exactly the outcome 
of every race or every event. And I knew if I had, you know, cheated myself on a couple of, you know, practices that it might catch up with me. And so I may not get the time that I'm looking for. And so, you know, if in, in a team element, you don't necessarily get that. You have to rely on someone uh, passing you the ball or, you know, have to rely on a coach putting you in the game. Well, you know, when you're on the line, it's you. And so, you know, I try to instill that in everybody that, that I work with and track that, it, you know, you are responsible for your outcome. And uh, I think that is, you know, those lessons within track and field can carry you further in life than uh, one would expect. And so, you know, I, and I, I've seen it done uh, hundreds of times now where, you know, kids are, you know, they take on various challenges that most people kind of shy away from, but, you know, a track person, they've been up against it um, at various levels, even at the youth, at, at youth meets, you see kids who, you know, that first couple of times they may shy away from that competition, but after they get used to it, and then they, they know what is expected of them and what they can do to make themselves better. And so I don't, I'm not sure in, in, in every avenue in life that is as a parent, but in track and field, you know, one of my models is track is the truth because it allows the truth to come out about who you are and what you expect to be. I love first of all, 100% agree. There's something special about track people, track coaches. We're, we're different, sometimes weirdly different when we start talking about our yeah. pole vaulters, but we're yeah. different, but we're built different because the expectation is different. Putting yourself on the line, you have yeah. no one to blame. It is right. you on that line, whether you're running a 5k, a hundred meter dash, long jump, shot put, it's on you. And so you are either going to be successful because of the work you've done or you're not. And so I love that you take that attitude mm -hmm. into your professional life as the director at Gately Park. That's like, hey, uh, it's me out here helping direct what meets we're going to have, the flow, the officials, all the millions and millions of things that you have to do with a facility like that. I mean, no, no one really understands it until you're in the muck. So uh, I, I love that. And I would describe you, right. uh, you know, knowing you a little bit here now and through here in your history, you know, you are that track guy i mean you, you know they talk about uh if you cut me i'll bleed you you would bleed red right because you're a hoosier right yeah you, you know that's that's the i know a bunch of indiana <laughs> people i get it i get it um but you know yeah. you craig i think if you cut yourself you'd bleed track material you would just have track just pouring out your veins man you are track yeah. through and through but because of that i want to hear your opinion so you know the uh track world has been up in a, a stir because of what happened this past weekend when you're listening now you're probably it's probably two weeks ago but i know you talked about it because you're a track person uh dk metcalf right he goes out and he runs 10 36 which um you know i heard guesses all the way from 9.8 to 11.8 so it was all over the map but he ran a very respectable respectful 10 36 now respectful for speed maybe not for professional track because you know he got i think almost like i think you know he beat maybe two kids and or two guys in the uh the other heat um but what did you think about this whole dk metcalf thing in regards to was it good for track and field was it bad disrespectful respectful what was your opinion on this you know uh so my first reaction is you know, it's kind of a shame that we have to rely on a talent from another sport to bring attention to our sport. And so unfortunately that is my reaction. And I, and I try to work in a positive space, but, but you know, I, I like the idea that, you know, although it was a great situation, it was a great setup that had been developed once we saw DK Metcalf hawk down that I believe it was someone from the Atlanta Hawks maybe. Yeah, I'm not an NFL. Once we I saw that, it, yeah. yeah, it was, and, and so it was, you know, that was impressive. And, you know, I liked his um, contention that um, I think I could run with track and field athletes. And so for me, that was the challenge. And so, you know, it, it was a challenge for 
the elite track and field athletes of the world to stand up. And if he were to take that jump into a track and field meet, then they would, you know, kindly let him know that this may be a bit much for you. And so with <laughs> that, I appreciate what happened. Craig. But at the same time, I, um, I, I love I love how you put that. They will kindly let him know <laughs> this may not be for you. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, you know, I I I think and it's I go back uh in remembering when Michael Jordan uh left basketball to play baseball. Yeah. And I remember I remember a comment that Deion Sanders made about uh, himself saying that it'd be a lot easier. This is Deion Sanders saying this. It'd be a lot easier for me, Deion Sanders, to make a um, football. Well, no, what was it? Uh, it was a totally different. Uh, it would be easy for him to make an NBA team than it would be for Michael Jordan to play at the major league level. Hmm. And so, you know, I remember that and remember that it's a matter of like pride. Like if you're at the top of your event, top of your sport, top of your game, you know, you don't want outsiders thinking, you know, or diminishing the reputation of your sport. And so, you know, it, and it's not like track and field athletes are getting multi-million dollar contracts. And so they work extremely hard to make a living at that level. And so I think when someone, you know, not that, and I'm sure that DK has a lot of experience in track and field, um, but he's not elite. And so, you know, I, I, it was good to see those things played out. Now at the same time, I would have welcomed DK Metcalf running like a nine nine and 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 you know all of a sudden there's a lot of talk about him maybe going to the trials et cetera and and maybe even getting there I mean that would be a great story but you know I I think that sometimes we discredit um, and devalue um, the time that these athletes are putting in to be world champions. Mm. And, you know, world champion in the 400 meter hurdles uh, requires a great deal of time, um, sacrifice, um, and, you know, in, a, in some cases, luck to get to that point for, you know, 15 minutes of fame, whereas we have football players, baseball players, and basketball players who, you know, sometimes it, it's not as difficult. Mm. And the reward, once they get to, you know, that level is immense, it's life-changing. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I, 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 I value anyone that has the ability to put themselves in an elite space and participate with elite athletes. And I, and, 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 and so, and lastly, I hate the idea that, and I don't, I don't know if this is true, but, you know, I hate the idea that track and field needs these one-off events to take place to save the sport. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people should, appreciate track and field for what it is. Um, and it is one of the most beautiful sports, one of the most diverse sports that you can ever be involved in. And I think, you know, that's what it is. Yeah, I think, you know, I agree with a lot that you said there, Craig, and, you know, shout out to BK, because he did two things for me that I thought was yeah. pretty important. One was, he actually he prepared, he didn't just try to show up with his 
quote unquote mm-hmm. natural speed. Like, you know, he worked with a sprint coach on how to go through phases and everything. Like he, he, he prepped, right. He's a professional. Uh, he also is super smart with his, uh, right. you know, he's an Under Armour athlete. Uh, Under Armour got a lot of pub for this as well, by the way, that was super smart mm-hmm. on, on their part. Uh, but two, so, mm-hmm. you know, he prepared, which, you know, he's a, prof- that shows he is a professional. Uh, and it's very hard for me to give him props, by the way, you know, he went to Ole Miss and I'm a former coach at Mississippi state. So it's hard mm-hmm. for me to say anybody from Ole Miss did a good job, but DK right. did a good job, uh, but he prepared, but also he, he humbled himself. You know, when he got done, uh, when he was on that interview, he was like, Hey, yeah, like I'm paraphrasing here, but he was like, uh, I'm fast, but not these guys fast. Like these guys are a whole different yeah. level. Like he gave respect to that. And, you know, one of the things that no one ha- I, that I've seen has talked about so far, we talked about the eyeballs that came to uh, NBC for the meet this weekend. Right. But what we're forgetting is when the NFL starts, uh, I think he plays for the Seahawks, right? Uh, every Seahawk game, I almost guarantee you, they are going to show a clip from that track meet. So we're going to get yeah. track yeah. and field on an NFL audience, even for a short amount of time, but we're going to help expose more people to this great sport. And I'm sure there's going to be enough high school, college and NFL football players that are going to start chirping and be like, well, wait a minute, DK, I understand he got ninth in his heat or whatever he got, but I'm faster than DK. Maybe I should try track. It. Like we're going to get some sure. positivity out of this. So I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. We, we, we forget that this is going to replay during NFL season. I think that's going to be a, that's going to be a big deal for us. I, I think. And by the way, yeah, and I think you're right. And, and, and go ahead. The, well, I was going to say, you know, the real story, by the way, of the meet was, was Shakari. I think I'm pronouncing her name, right. Shakari Richardson. That, that, yeah, that, that was the real, like, uh, and, and by the way, and I'm talking about Michael Norman ran real fast, Rye Benjamin ran real fast, Katie Najat yeah. vaulted real well. I mean, yeah. uh, Will Clay, I think, jumped real far. I mean, there was a, a ton of amazing performances, yeah. and Shakari Richardson uh, overtook them all. Holy cow, she looks yeah. amazing. Like, uh, can she set the world record yes. type of stuff this year? That, that's going to be exciting. That's, uh, it's, it's so fascinating how fast she's running right now. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I I agree, and 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 those stories provides the drama for track and field. Yeah, you know, will she get to that yeah. goal? And you know, not, and when will she do it? Will she do it at the national championships right. Olympic trials, or will that happen at the Olympics? And so, um, you know, you know, we have people love drama, and I think when we could introduce that level of drama for this particular sport, I think we will have, you know, better uh, participation from a spectator standpoint. We'll have more uh, television um, as opposed to the midnight specials that we, you know, sometimes we get. Um, we can now see it prime time. And yeah. so, and, and and that's because we're following the drama. and. You know, you have uh, a multitude of athletes that have individual stories of how they got there and where they're trying to be. And that's, you know, it, and it's just not in track and field. It's also, you know, you think about the Olympics, you know, a lot of the athletes and a lot of sports have those. But, you know, we talk about track. We're talking about, you know, someone that may have come from a small town, small school, and made it to this huge stage to become a world champion. I mean, that's, and and the sacrifices, Mm -hmm. um, that's always adds to the great level of drama. And so, you know, I, you know, that's why I love the sport because, you know, we, you know, that, you know, oftentimes, you know, the the best stories I, I hear are those athletes that are not only training for the Olympics, but also have a job. Mm. like a full-time job, part-time job. And, you know, but this is their dream. And yet they are, you know, uh, as common as you get in terms of our American society, they have to maintain and pay the bills and all of other things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they do it. They, you know, they seek that elitism uh, to become an Olympian or world champion uh under those conditions and so 
you know, I, I, I just love the beauty of, of all of that. And it just makes, for me, it, it makes the, the, the sport special and the, uh, the outcomes uh, better, especially when they turn out well. But sometimes even the catastrophes in track and field, you know, you person has done well all the way up to the world championships or the Olympics, and he or she falters over a hurdle or, you know, uh, you know, I, I hate the disqualifications, but even that creates a level of drama mm-hmm. um, or the relay races, who's going to run anchor leg. And so all those things, you know, play up well uh, in my mind to even that last, who's going to take the last second shot in the basketball game. And right. those for me are oh so dramatic. And so, you know, it, I don't understand sometimes why, you know, we you have to see delayed broadcasts when, you know, everybody who understands track and field knows that this competition, this duel between these two individuals could be the best thing in athletics right now. So, well, you mentioned everybody loves drama. So let's create some drama. We're going to put you on the clock here, put you in the hot seat. We're going to do three random questions. Okay. Not so rapid, but we're going to get through this. We're going to have a little bit of fun here, Craig. So I've got, uh, if this is your first time here in this, this is our 100 random questions that I came up with. So they're probably terrible. We started it last week uh, with Jeff Hartwig. We had uh, fun with him. Now we're going to have fun with Craig Collins. So Craig, I have a hundred questions. They're random because you get to guess, or you get to give me the, the three numbers and then I'll give you the question. What's your first number, sir? What number would you like to start with? Let's start with three. Oh boy. Three. All right. A hole to throw money. You've owned, you own a big boat. What are you going to name it? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Um, I think I'd call it, uh, hmm. I'm not saving you. I'm going to let this one ride so out. I, think I, I would call it, uh, Scoopa, uh, S-C-O-O-P-A. Okay. You got to explain and, that. Uh, that was, or is a family nickname that, um, only my sister, my dad would call me. And um, well, that, not only that, I guess a couple of people in the neighborhood would call me that too, but that is one way I would know that that person knows me. Knew uh, so yeah. I think if I, you know, had a lot of money or the boat, I'd put that on there just to, you know, create the question. What, what, what does that mean? Yeah. It would add for a good conversation after. That's awesome. The SS Scoopa. I love it. <laughs> right. That's good. SS All right. Scoopa. What next number? Where are we going to next? Let's go to number 10. You know, there's a hundred, right? We can, you know, we got a lot of numbers here. All right. Number 10. <laughs> We're going to stay, stay in the oh, okay, numbers. Yeah. No, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Okay. We're going 10. <laughs> number 10. You don't get the, you don't get to throw back a number. You went 10. Here we go. Number 10 chance encounter. What fictional character would be the most boring to meet in real life? And, and why is it Aquaman? Boring. Like that, yeah, and why boring. is it Aquaman? Because that guy would be the most boring person. Although we could be on the SS Scoopa and meet Aquaman. Maybe that'd be more interesting. Yeah, right. That, that, that might work. Uh, the most boring fictional character. Wow. I told you I, I wrote never these. thought about boring. The worst, worst questions in the world here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for agreeing there, Craig. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, let's see here. Um, Hmm. Boring fictional character. I think it would be. Um, hmm. Wow. Uh, fictional character. I most of the characters I can think of would be somewhat interesting. I don't think about the boring ones, but if I had to choose one, I think they would be. Um, hmm. uh, the wizard in, um, 
wow, I can't even think of the story now. Like, uh, like, like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter? Yeah, or... right. Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, the um, he was the bad wizard. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The one that, I mean, so it sounds like his story will be interesting, but I think, mm. you know, we, we kind of know where he's going. I mean, in, in, yeah. I, I read the book and I saw the movie and I, you know, I just wasn't, you know, impressed. Not that it was written boringly, but it was, you know, I think I've, you know, I, I would have less interest in that guy, more interest in the people that were doing things for good. Yeah, I feel you. We just binge watched. I don't know. Uh, me and me and the family just yeah. binge watched it. Uh, yeah. The, th the three Lord of the Rings movies, and and honestly, it didn't hold up for me. It wasn't that good. I, yeah. I, I, I feel you. I, I'm with you. All right, you got really? one. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, your uh, one more question, and then you can get off the hot seat. Where are we going? One through a hundred. Let's go fifty-three. Oh boy, fifty-three. Let's go for a ride, man. You 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 got all the things. You had the boat earlier. Now let's go for a ride. What is your dream car, sir? If you could have one, no cost is not an issue. What's your dream car? What you what you riding? Okay. You know, I I've always uh, with, with the many years that I've gone to the Chicago Auto Show at McCormick Place. Yeah. The you know I have never left the auto show without seeing what the Porsche looks like, mm. Porsche. And so now I'm hearing that that is not as comfortable a ride as I would like it to be, but it's just, um, you know, the, the idea of going fast in a car that is known to be fast, mm -hmm. I guess. So I'd have to go with the um, Porsche 911. No, no one's going to hate, man. It's a Porsche, right? I mean, that's an iconic car. Everybody wants to at least yeah. drive a Porsche at some point in their life. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. my man, you survived. You did a boat. <laughs> you yeah. took us to Lord of the Rings. Uh, and then we finished up on a Porsche, which, yeah, that's a pretty good way to, uh, to end the show right there, man. Craig, I'm just so, so, so thankful for you to be with us today, man. Your, your time is one of the most important and expensive things you can ever give me. So to spend the time with us today and get to learn more about you uh, just humbles me like nobody's business. And then, of course, to learn about this amazing facility that is going to be transformational. That is not I'm not using that word lightly. It is going to be transformational, specifically in the spot of Chicago. Uh, I'm just super excited. And I'm so uh, happy and proud that you're at the helm, man. I'm just so, so thankful. Well, thank you very much, Mike. It's always a pleasure talking with you, man. And, and you know, anytime you're in Chicago, think of this place as your second home. Um, you know, what you've, you know, you know, done for this place in terms of helping us with the equipment uh has been just i mean it made life easier for me because i know that we're, we're dealing with quality stuff man so um you know i'm glad that you know we were able to connect the way we had and 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 you know i can i consider you a, a good friend man thank you so much that means the world to me a second home and that's the second home Jeez, i must be doing something <laughs> right man <laughs> so craig thank you so much for being with us today and thank you for being here and listening to us today if you received value from today's show i'm willing to bet that someone else in your network would uh, have received value from this as well and maybe you're just interested and want to have other people be interested in this amazing facility and this amazing person right here so please share it on twitter facebook instagram tiktok whatever else all you cool people are using nowadays I'm just a Twitter guy, so I don't know anything about all that other stuff, but please share it and then join us next week where we're going to do it all over again and have another awesome track coach here on the Connections Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Have an awesome day.